Does it make a difference when ex-felons are given a chance to clear their criminal records? We'll discuss this issue on Talking with Henrietta, coming up next. <laughs> Hi, I'm Henrietta. Welcome to the show. In the November 2014 election, California voters overwhelmingly approved Prop 47, a ballot measure that changed how certain criminal offenses are classified, and it changed the way certain offenders are sentenced. Prop 47 also allowed some offenders who had been previously convicted under harsher laws to apply for a reduction in their sentences. It was a proposition that divided the criminal justice and law enforcement communities. It has now been seven months since the proposition was passed. On this show, I will talk with a staff attorney and two who were formerly incarcerated to discuss some of the changes that have happened in the aftermath of Prop 47's passage. Manuel LaFontaine is an organizer who works for all of us or none a project sponsored by Legal Services for Prisoners with Children. Manuel says that he helps build the voices, visibility, and leadership of formerly imprisoned people and other people most impacted by incarceration. To my left is Willard Burtz. He was convicted in 1996 of carrying an unlocked firearm and received a sentence of 25 years to life. Since at that time, he as an ex-felon received an additional seven more years under California's three strikes law. So his total sentence was 32 years to life. He was released from prison in July 2013, having served 18 years of his sentence. Seated beside him is Indria Richardson, who is a graduate of both Harvard College and Stanford Law School. In April 2014, she joined Legal Services for Prisoners as a postgraduate law fellow. A year later, she became a staff attorney at the organization. Thank you very much, the three of you, for being here with me. Uh, I mentioned that there are two of you at the table, seated here with me, who are uh, formerly incarcerated. So, well, I talked a little bit about you. Uh, give us a little bit about your story and your, how you received the 32-year sentence. Well, in 1995, uh, March the 20th, I had a defective tail light on my vehicle, and I was pulled over by the San Jose police. And at the time, I was on parole. I was living in San Jose, and they have search and seizure clause for people that are on parole. And I was driving my recently deceased father's vehicle, and uh, they searched the vehicle, and they found an unloaded 38 in a cassette case between the two front seats. I had a female passenger in the car with me, and a lot of police showed up. And they searched, and they found this weapon, but my prints wasn't on there. And I guess due to my past record, I had been to prison seven times before, that uh, I received this harsh sentence from Santa Clara County. You had been in prison seven times before. What had you been in prison for? Well, some of it is uh, related to Prop 47, possession of marijuana for sales. I received seven years out of San Mateo County, possession of controlled substance of Santa Clara County. I have three or four convictions or, you know, possession of small amounts of narcotics and uh, a petty theft with a prior. So when you were pulled over in 1995, did you really have a broken tail light on the car? Uh, well, the car was stolen from me uh, a month before, and when I got it out of the impound, the tail light was broken. It looked like somebody took a round object or something like a flashlight and busted the plastic. So when I went to the dealer, the Nissan, to order a light, they have stuff what they call tail light tape. And they tape it over the busted plastic. And I found out that something was wrong with the wiring or the light. If I hit a bump, the light would go out. So the, real, the vehicle was registered to Willard Burtz 
That's my father. I'm Willard Burst Jr. Yes, and I meant to say that at yeah, the very you're, top. You're right. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I inherited this property, and like I said, I didn't have any knowledge what was in there or whatever. And they you know, just explained to me through the law that if I have custody and control of something, I'm supposed to know, you know what's in it. But I had no need to just trust my father or somebody in my family. And you never using looked. using a vehicle from you, going to point A. You point. never looked through the car. Well, the cassette case, they testified that there was 30 tapes on one side and 30 on the other. And the guy said, the officer, that he heard a clunk sound. And so he pulled all these tapes out and separated the plastic tray that the tapes go in there. And this were. So you received 32 years to life and went back to prison. And served 18 years, and what happened? It's you're at least at least 15 years from the <laughs> 32 years. What happened? Uh, well, there was another proposition before Proposition 66, which was shot down. That was for uh, the California voters to reconsider certain sentencing laws. So Prop 36 came along in 2012, and I have a nonviolent, non-serious crime, so I filed a writ of habeas corpus. And my previous attorney at the time, 18 years ago, just happened to be the assistant public uh, defendant for Santa Clara County. And he contacted my daughter through an email. And uh, we began to contact with each other. And he came to visit me at Solano Prison and said uh, he could do whatever he could to get me out. He's the assistant district attorney right I mean, now? Not, not district attorney, excuse me, public defender. Oh, OK. Public defendant, my bad. So me. he contacted you right. and said he could possibly get you out. Right, right. And that was when? Well, they made a video. Because at the time, my daughter was on her way to go to Paris, her and one of my nieces. And uh, after she graduated from Stanford University, she had some master's degree in education from Stanford. And so they were taking this trip. So this video was made through Raji the debug video thing. And uh, after showing this video to the Santa Clara County Three Strike Committee, the DAs, they released me from prison the next day. They didn't contest. April 2013. Uh, July the 23rd, 2013, I was released. Released from prison. Yes. We'll get back to your story. Emmanuel, tell us something about yours. You're now a community organizer, but you're also formally incarcerated. So. When were you incarcerated and for what? Well, growing up in one of the most racist counties in uh, California, which is San Mateo County, the conditions uh, back home in Daly City were very challenging. I mean, it was hard for me to, you know, go to school without being um, considered, you know, a, a, a low life by, by teachers, by fellow students. I had a lisp issue growing up, and this forced many of us to be insecure and develop self-hate. And many of us formed the line with other people and because we didn't have no consciousness, we were then considered gang members. So I went to prison for um, hurting another member of my community because I did not know who I was. And it, you know, it took a lot of, uh, of me and to realize, and like I was sharing before the show, that it was um, guards or uh, deputies in the San Francisco County Jail that helped make me the, mold me. So you were convicted of assault. What, I was convicted of assault, assault with a deadly weapon. And you then had to spend, what, uh, six years? Well, six years of, of, of my um, life. Oh, I got a six-year sentence. I ended up spending close to uh, four and a half years inside. And how did you get out? Um, recognizing who I was and who I wasn't. And what does that mean? Recognizing that I could be an asset to my community instead of a liability. Recognizing that I did not really have an issue with the person that I shot or anyone that looked like me or rather with the system that created the conditions. And how did, how did you recognize that? Well, like I said, guards um, beat me up in the county jail, in the San Francisco County Jail. And I remember one time it, while I was getting assaulted, they said this uh, North and South is not going to play in this jail. Where are the gang are going to follow our rules? And light bulb went up. That's when the epiphany is like, whoa, I mean, we have a common problem. Uh, and so, you know, we, I had to somehow recognize that I'm not going to be playing this pawn game, this economic so and political pawn game. So how did you get game. out? How did you get out? I, got a, I, got a, I had a, uh, a date, a date to come home, and I didn't catch any more time. And when the date came, I mean, I paroled from a solid state prison. OK, we'll get back to your story, too. <laughs> we could talk about, for the two of you, maybe just for the whole show, 
So, Andrea, how did you get involved in all of this? And are their stories typical of some of the people whom you deal with? Um, I got involved with criminal justice uh, when I was, after I graduated from college and I worked on HIV prevention um, in New York and worked with a lot of communities that were really being terrorized by police, um, by, you know, lots of people whose parents had been in prison or jail, um, whose partners were in prison or jail, um, who were coming into contact with the system pretty frequently and didn't necessarily have the resources um, to have attorneys or um, advocate for themselves. And so I started doing work with, um, when I went to law school, I worked in our community law clinic and um, focused on record expungements um, and saw how important it is for people to expunge their records um, after coming home. And when you say expunge their records, what do you mean? What does it mean to expunge a record? Yeah, that's actually, it's a pretty um, inaccurate term that we use, I actually shouldn't use it. Um, in California and in other states, there are a variety of laws that can help. In California, um, probably a better term is to dismiss and set aside certain misdemeanors or to reduce certain felonies on a person's criminal history. Um, that it still appears on their record, um, but for certain purposes, like for some job applications or housing applications, the person does not have to say that they were convicted of a felony or a misdemeanor. Did that make a difference to you, Manuel? Uh, when you came out of prison, what was it like? It was a challenge to somehow reintegrate in a society that didn't accept me to begin with. So to find systemic barriers, and I say systemic deliberately, because it's systemic discrimination that governs the reentry process, the inability to find housing, the inability to find sustainable employment, the inability to find or access public benefits can create this uh, revolving door policy, for lack of a better word, where many of us have to commit or are involved in the informal economy to survive because the formal economy will not hire us. So what did you do? So first of all, you spent six years. When did you get out? I got out in April 20, uh, 2003. And what did you do? I started knocking on people's door, literally. I mean, knocking on different for places for employment, for, for housing, for ways to sustain myself. And? and eventually, um, the EOPS program at City College of San Francisco with Alvin Jenkins um, opened up that door. He hired now me. Now, what's the EOS program? EO Extended Opportunity Program and Services, a second chance program. And the director then was Alvin Jenkins. So how did you get from knocking on people's doors, trying to get housing, to getting to a college, into a program? Um, I think it was a combination of factors that, unless I found meaningful employment that required meaningful, sustainable education, that I'd be able to really sustain myself uh, for the long run. So uh, many of us cannot sustain ourselves flipping burgers. Although it seems well and it might help us, it might be a stepping stone, we need health benefits. We need to provide for our families. We need to feed our families, especially one of the most expensive places to live in, in America. The yes, Bay Area. I heard today, it seems absolutely incredible, that it takes $65,000, what? Oh, $65 an hour for an average apartment of $3,000 a month. So if you're formerly incarcerated and you can't get a job and you can't get decent housing and you're excluded from programs, you're really excluded, aren't you? Yep, and yes. some of us will not have those signs that says, please give me food. Some of us have dignity. And you know, this country was founded on thief, on thievery, on, 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 on stolen land, on, on, on genocide. So like I said, when we found a person like me and many members of all of us not found out about a true history, we were able to at least figure out, okay, well, let's raise those contradictions and let's figure out how do we 
open opportunities for people. So we developed that campaign, uh, our Ban the Box campaign, which looks at uh, systemic discrimination, which looks at that question, have you ever been arrested, have you ever been convicted of a felony, and try to eradicate that from all applications uh, under the sun. So when you say ban the box, it's what? Banning, taking off that question right. from housing applications or from job applications. From life insurance applications. Have you been successful in um, doing Yes, that? We've, had, we've done it in over 17 states, in over 100 jurisdictions, and even private corporations like Walmart, Target, and most recently the Coke industry has looked at their hiring practices and made um, certain adjustments to allow many of us to be able to access jobs. Uh, Willard, what happened to you? So you were released in 2013, I think April 2013. No, July. 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 Okay, July, well, April. You were April. When right. <laughs> well, before I was released, before they uh, granted me my release, I made I wrote out a one-page plans and preparation what I would do. So I had written a lot of different organizations, and one of them reached out to me. It was called Options Recovery in Berkeley, California, where they run nine houses, substance abuse type of thing. And I remember reading in the newspapers why this law was being written, the uh, Prop 36 law, that are most people that are recidivism, repeated offenders, somebody like me that's been incarcerated quite a few times, it has something to do with substance abuse or alcohol. So this program was formerly people that were addicts and uh, formerly incarcerated people that run these programs so they know, you know how to deal with the situation. But it was a year program and I felt after 10 months after I established my identification again, uh, my identity, my medical coverage, you know, I was declared disabled. Uh, I had to reach out to uh, uh, other medical places as far as uh, to treat me for my post-traumatic stress over the 18 years I was incarcerated, to uh, for totally of over 30, 38 years. So what, uh, when you talk about post-traumatic stress, what does that involve? That's something that reoccurs over and over that you witness. For you. Right, that's something you witness with your eyes, you know, your ears, things I've seen and heard. In prison. Right, over the, most of my time was done in maximum security prisons. Some places where I've been locked down eight, ten months out of the year behind somebody else's behavior younger than me. I'm 57. I'm not a gang member. I call myself a conscious, aware, spiritual man, you know, and I embrace Islam in prison. It kind of like, you know, saved my life, gave me a different outlook, you know, because it takes discipline. But at the same time, you were involved in, what, activities in prison somehow or other that no, they have a point system. So somebody that's been to prison many times, if I have, you have a reputation as far as maybe a higher security, right? And maybe they don't like the type of mail you receive. And, you know, if you're trying to educate yourself, like this man said, I'm not trying to create problems with other people that are going through suffering oppression or being oppressed or trying to be dehumanized. They're not my enemy. I had to become aware about, you know, my condition, what got me here, how can I change myself? Once we'll, I changed what was in me, then the Creator changed my condition. That's why I'm sitting here right now today. Okay, so we will get back to how you happen to be sitting here and what you did when some of the doors opened. But, Indria, as I might have asked you, the cases that we've heard right now, are they typical? for some of the people that you deal with and, and what's typical? Or is there any such term, concept in what you're doing in terms of helping the formerly incarcerated? Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure how to answer that question. Um, I mean, first of all, I think I, I work as part of an organization where we, um, we're all working together, right? It's not like we're evaluating each other's stories or that I'm thinking about, um, I think the term typical is a little bit of a hard one. Um, it's like normal. <laughs> What's normal? Okay. What's normal? I think as, so, you know, Manuel So are, what I'm, I'm thinking of, are these stories unusual or are they similar 
to some right, of the other sure. stories of those that whom you work with? Well, I mean, I think in the context of um, just some of the laws that we've even pretty briefly spoken about, you know, neither Manuel nor Willard's experiences, they're pretty by the book, right? I mean, you get out of prison, we don't have our state and most of the states in our country don't really have robust like rehabilitation plans to get people jobs, to get people houses, to restore people's rights to them. Um, so in that sense, you know, these stories are really typical in that this is how our system sets people up. You know, it's designed this way. So, um, yeah, yeah. Now, I now, say now typical, it's yes, interesting. In that Some way. people would take issue with the idea that it's designed this way, that it sucks people up. Mm -hmm. I said sets, sets people sets up. Sets people also up. Also sucks, though. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll, we'll. Before I get to Manuel for his view of that, um, <coughs> explain me. that, uh, wh why me. you say um, it's the system is designed that way. Why would it be so, of, it, of interest in the system? Okay, so when I say the system, what I mean is very specifically our reentry <coughs> laws. The reentry laws in the state of California are we, you know, we allow landlords to discriminate against people with criminal history convictions. We allow them to just not rent houses to them. We, in fact, allow people to kick people out of their houses if it turns out that they've been letting someone with a criminal history live with them. Um, we let employers discriminate against people with criminal histories, right? So it's not illegal to um, for a private employee to just not hire someone because, you know, for some reason they think that they, uh, someone's conviction is, is enough to judge them on. Um, we, and, and I so that's, to, what I, that's just what yes. I mean by design. These are, <coughs> these are the me. laws. It's not like this is like a kind of a fluke or. Sure, and it seems to me those laws don't make sense. And I'm sure it seems to a lot of other people. Because how do you expect people to get out of prison and lead meaningful lives to reenter back into society if they aren't given opportunities for employment, if they aren't given opportunities for housing, decent housing, and all of the things that are necessary to, 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 to live what we would consider a productive life? Can I interject on that? Of course. Well, so you imagine how I felt after 18 years when most of my family had deceased and I relocated to another county, Alameda, to Oakland, Berkeley. I'm from East Palo Alto. So I had to learn a whole new system over there. And it was very difficult trying to uh, obtain uh, housing. A lot of places do discriminate if you have certain type of felony convictions as far as like narcotics, what we're dealing with with Prop 47. They can exclude you from renting there. And as far as me uh, to try to upgrade my work skills, I had to go to the Department of Vocational Rehabilitation. That's a state agency. And they worked with me. I was blessed to connect with some people that understood my particular need, uh, my disability. And I attended the College of Alameda, a workability, where I obtained a job as a security guard. And where did you live in the meantime? I was living in Ber Berkeley in the house. After about 10 months, I moved in with a nephew that I hadn't seen since he was eight years old. He's 10 years younger than me, and he lived in Oakland, and he happened to work in Berkeley, and uh, that worked out. And then I uh, got accepted into Stanford University, a project remade, and they helped me cultivate a business that I own now. You know, it's hard to find employment, so I created my own. And how long have you had it? It's been uh, about six months. What type of business it's is it? It's a mobile auto detailing of a waterless car wash. And are you able to sustain yourself with it? Yes, I am. So there are people, Manuel, who would say you can do it if you try, that it's up to the individual. You can really make it if you try. I can only laugh at that fairy tale. I don't hear the laughter, but, <laughs> but it's, it's a fairy tale. <laughs> it's a fairy tale. And I want to go back. I would argue that these laws make sense. It, these policies make sense to corporate America, to the corporate executives, to the think tanks 
to the lobbies that support the, the, the prison union, to the lobbies that support big pharmaceutical company or big, big cannabis or anyone that's profiting off incarceration, the big bail bonds, the lobbies for the bail bonds. It makes sense to them. To have you going back and oh, forth. Oh, yeah. And back we and become forth. part of the contemporary slate. We're making money for them. I mean, look at the phone calls. The phone calls were extorting my mom, my dad, my family. How much are phone calls? I mean, it all depends, but I remember one of my phone, my, my partner's phone bill was about $700 for like I think half an hour when I was inside. And I, I, I did not want to call home because I didn't want my family. And you weren't calling to, to Europe? I was calling to, to <laughs> local. <laughs> What's local? local? Right? I mean, where was the prison? Well, I, I was in Solidarity State Prison, right? And so my family was located Which in the Bay in Area. Which is in California. Right, not far, about a hundred, couple hundred miles away. But it's not, it's symptomatic. I mean, the, the bail bonds, it's, 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 it's a multi-billion dollar industry. Who can pay, I mean, which low-income family can pay for bail? 70, over 70% 70 in, in, in San Mateo County of the people locked up can't afford bail or locked up because they're too poor to, to make bail. The Constitution says bail is supposed to be a reasonable amount for your income, and I'm glad you brought that up. In my particular case, the 12021A ex-felon, that's basically really not a serious crime other than my priors, and my bail was $500,000. If it went from 250000 to 500000 I think they wanted to make sure, once I served a year parole violation, that I wouldn't be able to bail out. But if, if you're making money for the bail bondsman, wouldn't they want you to be able to make well, bail? Well, they're making more money off of me because I'm a, I was living a recidivism type of lifestyle. But like this man said, I was in and out of there. And the 13th Amendment said slavery was abolished except for convicted felons. So that's still the law. So technically, you, you belong to the state. I made furniture in prison that we sit in on like this for eight, nine cents an hour. So, are you all still considered ex-felons? Oh no, I mean, all of us or none rejects discriminatory labels that emphasize conviction, that, that emphasize the inhumanity over our humanity. We're people, the operative word is people. So when we're called inmates, offenders, ex-offenders, ex-felons and the likes, we reject that because it's not that who we be, are. Wouldn't that be people who are ex-offenders or people who are <coughs> ex-felons? Isn't the people part just normally, naturally assumed? Would you consider somebody that's been divorced an ex-divorcee? Some people are called ex-divorcee. I've never heard that terminology before. <laughs> <laughs> I guess if they remarry, they would right, be. Right, but you uh, would not call <laughs> someone that's remarried an ex-divorcee because it doesn't make sense. But again, Associated Press, Corporate America, Multinational corporations have deliberately used certain language to dehumanize certain people and then treat them a certain way. Well, do you know what people would say? And I, I'm very happy to bring up this issue with you. They would say you dehumanized yourself when you committed whatever crimes you were incarcerated for. The cruelest thing colonialism and slavery did was make the natives forget who they were before foreign contact. Without U.S. or European intervention, the world wouldn't have so many wars and problems. So it's easy to look at the individual and blame responsibility for his or her action when it's social accountability, when it's corporate culpability that are the primary actors, the incubators of violence. So some people would say, look at Andrea. She went to Harvard. She went to Stanford. So the opportunities and the possibilities are there. She may have had Well, um, sorry, can I, I mean, I... I've broken the law many times. You know, I've like dehumanized myself. I've just, I, I was never arrested. I was never caught. And that has a lot more to do with my position. So than when you say you've broken the law, you didn't assault anyone, one assumes. You didn't commit a felony. Uh, I mean, I don't. Well, yes, I, I should. I think that I can be, I can be one example. There are certainly hundreds and thousands of people in this state who have committed felonies, who have not gone to prison, who have not gone to jail. Um, and I think that that's, right, it's, it's a structural issue who's policed and who is arrested and who is So punished. are you suggesting that the people who have more people should be arrested because they've committed felonies? No, absolutely not. I mean, I'm not suggesting that we treat everyone 
severely. I'm saying that I think as a culture, as a society, we're pretty primed to understand that some people can make mistakes and those mistakes don't define those people. And we're pretty primed to judge other people entirely by, you know, something bad that they did. And I think that has a lot to do with race and class and mm. education. I'd, well, like, I'd like to say too, uh, certain conditions are created by, you know, powers to be. You know, I can remember growing up, I never chose to be a criminal. I'd rather be a carpenter, electrician. I never wanted to be a drug dealer or armed robber or a burglar. So lack of knowledge and lack of, lack of education about self first and about different things and taking responsibility for my own actions and deeds led me to a 37, over 38 years of incarceration in my life, and I'm 57. So that gave me a lot to think about these last 18 years. And I come to realize that there's a lot of people in prison on the street because a lot of these housing projects, they all look, to, they look like housing blocks to me, like San Quentin or Folsom or Pelican Bay. It's just a different number on the door. So when you don't have the right knowledge and the right resources, you resort to certain things out of desperation to survive that may not always be the right thing, and there's gonna be a repercussion behind that, but you take a chance. You understand what I'm saying? So yes, now, you take a so chance, now, and sometimes I learned you get the hard caught. way. I learned the hard way. So I just, and there are this is something I this you... is something I never read in a book. I've been living it. And so chances... I had to make a drastic change to not to let somebody else control me, the way I think, the way I function, and what's normal. And what's there normal are chances for me. now that you would not take, because the risk isn't worth it. Not is, that has anything to do with that anymore to me. Right. My my heart has been changed. Right. It's not hard anymore. They tried to make me a beast or a savage by putting me in certain situations where my life was in danger. Well, I was a torture and dehumanized in prison. I have to sit here now with these lights on. I told you, these are prescription glasses, but I'm trying to accommodate you because I do have <laughs> common courtesy and a little respect. So, you know, like I say, these conditions that we live up under, they need to be changed. So, so people, you know, there's other solutions to problems other than mass incarceration or discriminate against people or deny people the opportunity of the life and pursuit of happiness that God gave us. God-given rights, not some man-made rights. Man-made laws to suit their own selfish needs. But the laws of the Creator, I don't mean to be spiritual, some people not, but that's the law that I try to follow now, and I, I don't have any problems. Manuel, you were going to say something. Well, it's who defines violence, right? You can go kill somebody that's de deemed an insurgent in Iraq, in Afghanistan, and come home and brag about it, and you're sanctioned as a hero. You're, uh, yet you go shoot someone that looks like you or, or, or doesn't look like you, and then you're labeled a criminal. However, some people would say if you go off to Afghanistan, you are killing, it's sanctioned killing, but supposedly you're killing for your country. You're killing for a higher cause. Is there a difference? Murder is murder. And what cause? Is it the corporate interest cause? Because many people in America that are of uh, low income status don't benefit from the same freedoms that the elitists and, and, and their offspring benefit. So you're now a community organizer. How did you get from having difficulty finding jobs, finding housing, to where you are now? I think it was a, a, a community effort. It was a bunch of people who opened up doors and who believed in me even when I was raw around the edges, even when I spoke truth to power, even when I made them uncomfortable. Even when they tried censoring me, I said, you cannot censor me, right? I'm gonna always speak truth to power. And yes, I was a destructive element in my community and I'm not proud of that. And I won't, but I won't, to this day, I will not hurt another person. From this day on, I will not hurt another person that looks like me. I will not hurt another person that doesn't look like me because I'm a community organizer, and we organize a community for uh, community self-determination. We want to determine our own policies. We want to kick out corporate America from our communities and, and, and make it so that the community benefits, and there's community benefit agreements as opposed to corporate agreements. So <coughs> is it, is it you've, you've chosen to kick out corporate power, given the power of corporations in this country? That might be extremely hard to do. Would it be? another option to join the corporate structure and being on the inside of it have some say <laughs> or attempt to have some say. 
let's go back to history a little bit. It's like saying I'm going to join the slave master because slavery will not be abolished. You cannot, not me, um, not many folks. They might not be as articulate, they might not be as spoken because of the fear of the iron fist that is known in America. You know, the law enforcement, the, the, the frame up COINTEL, counterintelligence program, what we know as COINTEL Pro. There's a fear of people speaking up to, to, to the injustices that we see in our communities. But who brings the drugs to our community? Who brings opium? There's no poppy fields here in East Palo Alto in America. There's no cocaine fields here in America. Who brings the cocaine into our community? Who brings the heroin? Fundamental, who brings the guns? I've never heard of any of my homies manufacturers of guns. So it's but then people would say, you don't have to use the drugs. You don't have to use the guns. You don't have to kill each other in the streets. And when people talk about police brutality and police violence, most of the time, a lot of the time, you hear that there isn't enough being said about young people in inner cities killing each other. But They've there's more being saying. They've been conditioned to kill each other. And I think that's important to recognize. How have they been conditioned to kill each other? Not knowing who they are, taking away their name. They're no longer called Kunta Kente, the names that their ancestors gave them. They're being called names like John's son, son of John, uh, Sam's son, son of Sam. Until we know who we really are, we're going to continue to propagate the system of self-hate. But many of us are saying enough is enough. So we want to build young leaders. We want to be able to recognize that they have the potential from birth. By to build young leaders to do what? To be the able work to be an in corporate asset, America? To be assets to the community. No, we, no, corporate America cannot bring freedom. Cannot bring freedom, not complete freedom to our communities. They will continue to rape, extract resources, exploit our communities. We cannot be dependent upon corporations. And sometimes it's uncomfortable people to say, but we have to go back and look at how history has played out. History continues to repeat itself. And now you have continued to have the lion tell the story. I mean, excuse me, the captor the hunter tell the story. And it's about time the lion and the lioness tell her story, tell his so, story. So how can people coexist together? If you put the corporations on one side as the enemy, and the corporations have the power, uh, and you want to bring up young people for leadership positions. Leadership positions to do what? If they go into politics, they'll need backing. If you go into politics, you can change some of the laws. So what are you bringing young children into leadership positions to do? <clears throat> I believe the, the function of society in a humane way, you know, like I was saying, you treat the others the way you want to be treated. Now, we're talking about the drugs, a statement you made about we don't have to use these drugs. And for me growing up in East Palo Alto, that's kind of like it was a central point of the Bay Area. There was only four ways in, four ways out. There's a Dumbarton Bridge, Highway 101, now they open university up. So when all these drugs came into my community, it devastated my community. I come home now after almost 20 years, I don't see people that look like me in my community anymore. Facebook is in my backyard. Before they were there, I was hunting rabbits. I was fishing as a kid with my homeboys. And now, like I said, you know, when you, when you don't have the right resources available to you and all these drugs just came out of nowhere, so that, my, that turned my city into a drugstore. People were coming from Frisco, San Jose, Hayward, whatever, boom, 24 hours, and that brought all the violence. And that devastated our community. And it's not the same anymore. And it's very painful me, for me to be over here to see the, the big change and what's going on with all these different businesses they had over there now. They didn't have when I was a kid or growing up as a young adult. They didn't have all these different stores and businesses. So once the, the geographic of the nature of the people changed, they brought in some new people. And now we have all these big resources and different things that's still not available to me. Most of my people had to move out of the Bay Area. They couldn't afford it. You were just talking about that a few minutes ago. So when the Pete Wilson had a rent freeze, he got rid of that and proposition when he went 84 and the three strikes and all these things, this affected a lot of people. Where so, they couldn't afford to sustain the livelihood in the Bay Area. They had to relocate. As a lawyer, Andrea, what changes in the law do you think need to be made 
to change some of the circumstances or some of the conditions that we're talking about? Is it a matter of changing laws? <laughs> That's a big question. Um, I think it's, there's a pretty holistic change needed, right? Like, I think that we're talking about changing like a really big structure that we live in, which is capitalism, I think. We're talking about changing the value <coughs> systems me. that people have, which we can certainly do before we come up with a sustainable alternative to capitalism. We can still work to change people's value systems. And I think, yeah, part of that is also changing laws um, because laws have pretty concrete effects on people's lives. You know, if we criminalize drug use, if we put people in jail and prison for using drugs, um, that disrupts a person's entire life. If we, you know, put people in prison for these, like, inhumane, atrocious amounts of time, like 32 years, that's... That's an incomprehensible amount of time. Um, so I don't, I mean, what laws do we need to change? Like maybe all of them. Um, do you want like a, like a couple? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <coughs> we have Excuse Prop 47 <coughs> where people can clear their records. And we know the difference that that can make. You've held, there have been several clinics, right? Um, How have yeah, they been received? So... Across California, I mean, if we want to talk about what Prop 47 is, um, I think you went over it a little bit in the beginning, but across California, a lot of community-based organizations have been helping to imp implement this law that was passed, which changed a number of felonies in California to misdemeanors. Um, has that made a difference? Has that made a difference? It's made a difference on a lot of different levels. Um, I know you mentioned that Prop 47, it works. There, it's like a three-armed remedy, I guess. So people who, were, who are newly charged um, with these crimes will be ch charged with misdemeanors instead of felonies. People who were currently in prison for those felonies could petition the superior courts to be released, um, to have their their charges resentenced as misdemeanors and be released. Um, so what those two arms are doing is they're making an impact on California's prison population already. Um, it's being reduced. That now, is. No, there was a, cr a mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sorry for interrupting. There was a clinic oh, that yeah. was held a few weeks ago in East Palo Alto. Uh, how many came in to have their records cleared? So that event was actually the first part of a record clearance clinic. Um, during that event, we helped 63 people apply for their rap sheets, um, which is usually the first step in getting reentry relief. Um, you have to know what's on your rap sheet is your record of arrests and prosecutions. Um, it just shows what convictions are on your record. And it costs a lot of money in California. It costs $40. Um, sometimes you, the process is not totally straightforward. It can just be a barrier to people getting relief. On um, their own? On their own, yeah. So we helped people apply for them by getting a live scan, which is like the fingerprinting machine, um, bring it to an organization in the community, and paying for people's fees. Um, the forty dollar fee. The forty dollar fee. It's still forty forty dollars. Yeah, <coughs> that's a lot. Of money. <coughs> but for me, it for changed the lives. It potentially can change the life of the sixty some people who used those services a few weeks ago, and you'll be continuing to have these type of clinics. Um. So. Yeah, we'll be having a record clearance clinic where we actually help people fill out their Prop 47 petitions. Um, a lot of other organizations in the Bay Area, like East Bay Community Law Clinic, Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, um, hold these clinics very regularly um, to help people apply for relief. But it's 
I mean, it's a help, and I don't want to understate the help, but it's also, it's a, you know, it's not a huge solution to the problem of over-incarceration. Well, if I were to ask you, Manuel, what would be a solution? I'm sure there are several ideas that you would come up with. First of all, take the profit away from the punishment system, also known as the criminal justice system. You move that, then there's no incentive to lock up people. There's no incentive to persecute and prosecute people. Um, place those people most impacted, survivors of the punishment system, at the center of shaping laws, at the center of centers that are supposed to speak or support or provide services to us. And when I mean reentry services. So when you say place those people, people like whom? Like, like myself, like Ali here, uh, like Dorsey Nunn, like Linda Evans. I mean, I could keep going with people names. People who have who've been, been directly impacted. In the, formerly incarcerated. Right. In positions where they can help other people. Well, uh, in, in meaningful and influential positions, meaning as executive directors. And how do you get them there? Well, you got to have those. They that would are, start their own nonprofits. Right. Well, or, or they could get hired in positions. There's a lot of intermediary organizations that are making profit <laughs> of our misery or of our, of, of our problem. So that's the question. The system is designed the way it is right now. How do you, what needs to be done? to, for people who are profiting off of it, for them to change? First, they have to recognize their positions and what they're doing and what their privileges are giving them. So a lot of people say, well, you know, I, I, my, my ancestors, my mom, my dad, they provided for me, but it came at the expense of other people in third world countries. And people don't recognize that. So it's, it's recognizing first the privilege that we have as being educated. And this, for me, for example, I'm an educated male in, in, in America. That, that's a huge privilege. Even if I'm formally in college, that's a huge privilege because not many males in America are educated or have gone through the same uh, <coughs> uh, uh, privilege or been act, had access to the same privilege that I've had access to. So there's a lot of folks who don't even have a conviction record who have been able to, to, to get, obtain lower degree, doctor's <coughs> degree and all that, who are still not experts of our lives. Let me ask you this. If I spend four, seven, nine years of my life shadowing you, would you feel comfortable me speaking in your voice? Speaking in my voice? What do you mean? Speaking for me? Speaking for you on your behalf. If I were not able to speak for myself, but I would if, appreciate it. What if you were it. able to speak for yourself? <laughs> well, unless I ask you for the additional help, I don't think it would be necessary. But that's what's happening right now with people with JDs, all due respect, people with PhDs. They study people in different countries or here locally or in prison or in penal system. And then they consider us experts of our lives. When we've not only been able to survive it, but we're able to take care of ourselves. So it's a matter of taking the power back. Right. First of all, I don't think you can say to people who've gone to school to get the education that you're talking about, who are interested in a certain area, to say to them, well, no, you can't write books right. about people who are formerly incarcerated. I mean, that's America. They have a right to pursue the interests of their education. But it's now time for the people who've been formally incarcerated, like yourself, to do what you're doing. And that's to speak up for yourself <coughs> and me. for other people who are formally incarcerated, who've asked you to do so. I right? would ask, though, to share those resources. Sometimes formally, in fact, more often than not, formally incarcerated people are relegated to storytellers, to sign holders in the streets, to movers. We're more than that. We're attorneys. We're educators. We're We've yes, but you hold. know what? How do you ask other people to share their resources? And why should they? Because they didn't get to where they're at on their own. They wouldn't well, say that. I can answer that. Look at my story. I came after all these years of being incarcerated. I changed my way of life. Like I said, I've written a road map, what I need to do. The things I didn't know, I reached out to different people to help me to give me the advice. I, I just happened to be one of the unfortunate ones. You know, I was homeless for a minute, too. You know, but I wasn't holding a sign, like you said. I got dignity and respect about myself. So I started from using a bicycle to public transportation to BART to the AC Transit or whatever county I'm going to. It took me longer to get to these places to make these appointments, but I was determined that I don't have any room for failure anymore. I already wasted a lot of time. So, that's so that gave what, me the drive and yes, determination yes, and to that's go out here to make a road for somebody else coming home after me that these are the things that I've done 
that I went through, and maybe it can help you. That's so we can why be productive people in society and not be incarcerated, spending a lot of money where money could be spent somewhere else. That's why there are people who would say, and I think Eleanor Roosevelt said, no one can keep you enslaved or keep you down without your consent. And as soon as you realize, as you say, who you are, and you created a roadmap for your life, then you can begin to go down a different path. And there were people who would say, so what's stopping other people from doing that? Other people who are formerly incarcerated. The right information and the right resources. Right. Re you provide p p people the tools I, to discover I who themselves like a slave. and sustain I, themselves? I felt like a slave being freed, saying, you're free to go. Go where? After 18 years? Everything's been changed out here. Most of my relatives, now I'm the uncle that they call. My uncles are all deceased. My mom, I hadn't seen her in 27 years till my daughter took me up to Sacramento to go up there. You know, I had a brother that just did a life sentence 15 years. So this doesn't just affect me, it affected my mother. She had two sons doing life. Oh my. So she was, you know, we were blessed to all connect before she left this earth. So, you know, so what was it like for you, and are there, are you completely back? Well, uh, I'm completely back in many ways, but it's hard to even say that because there's many people are left behind who don't deserve to be in a cage. So there's a lot of folks that I'm fighting for, I'm articulating what I'm saying now for those that are left behind who shouldn't have been there because they were innocent to begin with or because they didn't have an opportunity to really uh, uh, access the so-called American dream that to many of us is an American nightmare. So until we are able to determine our own fate, until we're able to say, well, no, long, no longer will you speak in our own voice and our behalf, we have a right to the same access that everybody, the, the corporate executive, have. we should have the same access to because they didn't get there to become billionaires on their own. It came out the backs of a lot of people, not only developing countries, but here in America. A lot of my ancestors, a lot of your ancestors, a lot of our ancestors suffered to build the White House, to build the economy we have today. Until we shatter that illusion that everybody can make it to the top, you can't make it to the top. You need people at the bottom to support the top. And that's why there are people who would say there are always people in society who will be at the bottom. Until we change Society that. cannot cannot accommodate everybody being at the top. Not, not the current society in, in, what, in the valleys. Until we believe and, and, and really strive for a culture of interdependence where you recognize that your life is bounded to mine and my life is bounded to yours and to your kids and vice versa. And my kids ain't no different than yours, regardless of the economic status. Then we'll be able to well, develop. Well, there are those who would say, if your kid makes it and your kid makes it, that means something is taken away from my kid. That we can't, we don't have enough resources to go around. It's limited. That's a lie. That's a myth. And that's the American myth that's been propagated over and over and over, that has been stated so much that it's actually thought to be the truth. The reality is there's enough resources to support everybody in the world. Well, somebody make all the rules to the game where they're always winning and nobody else can. It's like a monopoly game. <clears throat> if y'all make all the rules, well, I'm always winning, you know, the other people are going to suffer from lack of knowledge or lack of resources, you see what I'm saying? Well, well if it's I'm, a just, I'm just trying to get on an equal playing field. You know, and I'm a, here I am, a small businessman trying to get started. You know what I'm saying? American dream. I came up with a product that the state is in a severe drought, and it normally takes 40 gallons to wash a car, and I do it in less than a gallon, and it's environmentally safe. So God put that in my mind, in my heart, connected me with the right individuals, and we, you know, we cultivate this, and now we brought it into existence. So, Andrea, we talked about laws, and I mentioned Prop 37, and you were going to give another example. Uh, was I? <laughs> I think I did hear you say, would you like an example of some laws? Now, if you can't think of a law, and maybe as we're talking you might think of some changes that can be made in the, in the legal system, do you think things are improving? Are the conditions <laughs> that we've talked about is there more awareness now than there might have been in 1996? More awareness around the justice system? The justice system. Um, Changing it, making it more equitable, or? Sure, I mean, I 
I want to say yes. Um, I think that Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, made a lot <coughs> more me. people aware of our criminal justice system. Um, I know that there have been certainly what I think of as really positive laws passed, like Prop 47 and like Prop 36. 36. Um, from a bird's eye view, I'd say sure, we are passing some good laws at the same time, you know, we're passing bad laws all the time too. Um, like just this session, there are already laws trying to chip away at Prop 47. Um, you still see bills being passed that are increasing sentences. Um, you know, I don't know. It's so I'll ask you that, Manuel. Are things changing? Do you see any improvement? Uh, yes, no. I believe that, that there's a lot of people becoming more aware, but there's been close to at least 500 deaths by law enforcement in our communities. And it's not even the end of the year. So the more we see progress, the more there's a counter uh, uh, effort to relegate many people back into contemporary slavery. Do you slavery. know, I find that that's a fact of life. Whenever there is a movement in one direction, there is that counter movement in the other direction. So people who are trying to move it in one direction have to constantly be vigilant, vigilant right. to keep on going, that you can never rest on your laurels, that there is a struggle, whichever side you're on. <laughs> right. Well, laws and rules are made to be changed. That's why we have amendments. These laws might not work you know, for a particular time. They do just like alcohol was banned to prohibition. So somebody like me coming home out of here I would like a clean slate, my record, if I'm able to sustain a business or employment somewhere and I'm paying bills and I'm paying taxes and I'm a registered voter now, first time in my life, I should be able to live wherever I can afford to live. I shouldn't have something to haunt me when I was in my 20s and I'm almost 60 years of age now and I made a drastic change in life to show that I can function and be you know, a productive person in society. And so these laws do need to be changed and they do help. I'm living proof that they, certain things do help. Oh, well, I think the two of you are living proof that it is possible to overcome circumstances right. and to have a dream and to have a road map. And there are people who are interested, like Indria, <laughs> mm -hmm. who have high degrees from um, well-respected institutions. I'd like to thank the three of you for being on to share your stories and to share the work that you're doing. and. I'd like to invite you back. I hope we can get together on a future show <laughs> and talk about the changes that have happened in the right, meantime. Right, right. So thank you very much for joining me. I'd like to thank the viewers for watching. Until next time. <laughs>